Father, we ask that you'll speak through your word by the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to have a simple study. Very, very simple. But let's all pay attention. Everyone have the Bible, by the way? <laughs> Nothing like that book. I love it. Have those Bibles. So I'm going to ask some questions, okay? Uh, what, what's the plan B, by the way? If someone says to you, you know, that's my plan B, what does that mean? A second, right? Or last. Uh, if plan A doesn't work out, then you can fall back on plan B. Isn't that right? Plan B is like a backup plan. Just in case your primary goals does not come to fruition, fall on your, back on your plan B. So that's what we're talking about this morning. All right? Now, when we talk about God, we say, uh, how much does God know? Uh, not a lot. Uh, we say that he has all, what everybody? Knowledge. Now, there's a fancy term we use in theology for that. Anybody know what that term is? Yeah, exactly. Omniscient. This is actually a compound word. Uh, two words from the Latin. Omni, meaning all, and scient, where we get the, um, the English science, meaning knowledge. And we uh, put these words together, and we say that God, Jesus Christ, Holy Ghost, the Godhead, they are omniscient. They know everything. Is that true? Only half of the folk answering me. <laughs> Do you believe that's true, that God knows everything? Oh, yeah. yeah, makes a lot of sense. But I want to submit to you this morning, it's very interesting to me, that there is one thing that Jesus never knew. Okay? So that's the thesis of our Bible study this morning. There is one thing that Jesus never, ever knew. Let's ask this question. When Jesus was in heaven uh, as God, God the Son, did Jesus know that he must die before sin entered planet Earth? It's an interesting question. Let's go to Revelation 13. Let's go to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Revelation. Did Jesus know he had to die? Let's see it from the Bible here. Revelation 13, verse 8. Revelation 13, verse 8. Are you there? The Bible says, in verse 8, And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life. Now watch the Bible. The book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the what? The Bible says the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Uh, in prophecy we know, and also John the Baptist declared, Behold the Lamb of God. Who was that Lamb in the Bible? Who was that Lamb? Jesus. So the Bible says this plan for Jesus Christ to die for humanity, this plan was laid before this world was even created. That's wild stuff. That, that's, very, that's very, very interesting. In other words, it was like when Jesus was in heaven, it's like Jesus had the blueprint. Anybody here in construction? Anyone here? Oh, you're in construction? <laughs> and you know how it is when you have that blueprint, that blueprint is laid, say you're building a house, and there on that blueprint, the master bedroom is here. The dining room is here. The living room is here. That blueprint in heaven, Jesus, you're going to be born here. You're going to grow up here in Nazareth. Jesus, you're going to have 12 disciples, some fishermen here. Jesus, you're going to die on Golgotha's hill. Here, that blueprint was laid in heaven. So before sin even entered this world, Jesus knew, hey, one day, hey, I'm going to die. Mm, that's very clear. Very, very clear. Jesus knew in heaven that death was imminent. What about at the age of a preteen, the age of 12? At 12 years of age, did Jesus know that he must die? You're all quiet today. <laughs> Did Jesus know at the age of 12? Okay, that's good. That's honest. I don't think he knew. I mean, maybe that's, that's good. What's your name? Rudy. Rudy said, hey, I don't think he knew that young. That's very honest. If I was there, I'd probably say the same thing. That's the early 12? Well, let's see what the Bible says. Let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 2. Plan B. Luke chapter 2. Did Jesus know as at 12 years, that he would die? What does the Bible say? In Luke chapter 2, and we know this very well, this is when Jesus was in that temple. 
answering questions, asking questions, etc. Jesus was very bright. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, go to verse uh, 41. Luke 2 verse 41. Are you there? Now the Bible says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was, how old everybody? 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answered and answers. This Jesus was extremely bright. Jesus there at the time of Passover, he is in the temple at, at what age? Twelve. Listen to what Ellen White says. Because you know you have a sacrifice during Passover. All right? She says here in Desire of Ages, for the first time the child Jesus looked upon the temple. He saw the white robed priests performing their solemn ministry. He beheld the bleeding victim upon the altar of sacrifice. Every act seemed to bound up his own life. The mystery of his mission was opening to the Savior. Oh, you missed that. Oh, you missed that one. <laughs> wow is right. Do you understand how powerful that statement is? So I'm going to ask the question again. At the age of 12, did Jesus know he must die? Yes. Who here is 12? Anybody here 12? You're 12. Can you imagine that? At their age, you're looking at the sacrifice on the altar, and as Jesus is looking at this lamb, Jesus at 12 is thinking. That's me. That sacrifice is pointing directly to me at 12. Wow, what a savior we serve. Amen? 12 years old, he knew he must die. In the kingdom of God, he knew he must die. What about as an adult? Did Jesus know as an adult that he must die? John 12. Let's go to John 12. John chapter 12 here. John 12. Go to verse 32. John 12, verse 32. I love it. John 12, verse 32. Did Jesus know as an adult that he must perish? The Bible says, are you there? Yes. Only two people there? Yes. <laughs> the Bible says in John 12, 32, Jesus speaks and he says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw how many men? He says, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus is saying this as an adult. And he says, hey, if I'm lifted up, I'm going to draw all men unto me. Question, when Jesus talks about being lifted up, is he referring to his death? How do we know? The very next verse. Go to the very next verse. Verse 33 says, this he said, signifying what death he should die. So here we have Jesus Christ as an adult. Jesus says, hey, I am going to be lifted up, and because of my death, I'm going to draw all men unto myself. And the Bible says he was referring to his death. He is going to die. That's interesting. But you know what's really something? Even though Jesus realizes as an adult that he must die, Jesus, he says some words that are very, very interesting. Matthew 26. Go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Very interesting. With our scripture reading here this morning. Matthew 26. The Bible says, verse 37. Now we, we know the context. Jesus brings three disciples with him. Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. And he is agonizing for humanity. All right? Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says in Matthew 26, verse 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, as James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. How many times did Jesus say that, by the way? Three times, right? 
He tells the disciples, hey, just pray for me. All three times, they're sleeping. Just watch the Bible. I love it. Verse 39. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be what? Ooh. Let this cup, that's the cup of suffering, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. You missed that. You understand how powerful the words of Jesus are in that verse? You understand how powerful that is? Jesus, he's in the garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying for the entire world. It gets so bad, the Bible says, as he's in that garden, all the, the weight of the world is being placed upon Jesus, the Bible says Jesus starts sweating great drops of what? You know, Fresno, this place gets really hot. This place, man, the other day was like 108 or something. <laughs> that's, that's triple digit. That's really hot. Have you ever sweat blood in Fresno? If you did that, you need to go to the ER quick. <laughs> I've never, I grew up in Florida, 23 years, hot, humid. I've never sweat blood in my entire life. But it was so stressful for Jesus. He is there and he breaks out sweating blood. Wow. Oh, that's significant. Why is that significant? You know why it got so bad? Because the third time when Jesus comes back, he finds his disciples, they're sleeping. If Ellen White tells us, if he found them praying, he would have been strengthened. They couldn't even pray. He said, what, you can't even watch and pray for me for one, just one hour? It got so tough for Jesus, the angel Gabriel came down and had to strengthen him. You hear what I just said? Gabriel, right now, his position is the covering cherub in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. He had to leave being the covering cherub because those three disciples did not want to pray for Jesus for one hour. Ooh. That's tough. Jesus is in this garden. <laughs> Listen to the Bible. The Bible is awesome. He's in the garden, and he's praying. He says to his father, if it is possible remove this cup what is Jesus asking for <laughs> exactly Jesus is saying to his father if there is any way if God if you can be glorified without me dying and having all this sin placed on me if there's any way out of this if there is a plan B do it Heard what I just said? You know how deep that is? Why is it so deep? Because we just learned. Regarding his death, he knew it when he was in heaven. The plan was in heaven. At 12 years old, he knew he must die. And as an adult, he knew that he must go to Calvary. If Jesus knew all of this, why is he crying out, Father, if it's possible? You know why? Mm. That sin is... No one wants to suffer, but this, this, this thing is so much deeper than suffering. In that garden of Gethsemane, listen to me, folks. The garden of Gethsemane, well, was that the toughest part of Jesus' ministry or the cross? It couldn't have been the cross because people die on crosses all the time. The cross could not be the hardest part for Jesus. You just die. You know what the hardest part was? You're right. The garden of Gethsemane. You know why? Listen to me. Don't miss what I'm saying. In the Garden of Gethsemane, all of our sins were dumped on Jesus. Okay, some of you missed that, so let me help you out. Okay, let me help you out. Because I want your mind to... The human mind can't even wrap itself around the concept. Have you ever sinned? Have you ever messed up real bad? Okay, only four of us here, but for the rest of you, that's perfect. Hey, I've been there. I've messed up bad. Well, you know, when you mess up, do you feel good about it? <laughs> Don't you feel guilty? You feel horrible. You feel bad. Yeah, if you don't feel guilty, you're in trouble. But you feel horrible. You feel bad. Then you make God a promise. God, I promise I will never do it again, and you do it the next day. That's one sin you feel guilty about, one. 
Can you imagine Jesus? He took the guilt of every single sin, not just from you only, but every single sin from Adam to the last baby born. You heard what I just said? In that garden, all that guilt was placed upon Jesus in one moment of time. Oh. We don't all comprehend that. That's, that's, that's beyond hard to comprehend that. And the thing is, that this is what we take, we take sin so lightly. But we don't know what it did to Jesus. That's why Jesus cried out, God, if there's another way out. I know all this, Lord. I know I'm God. I know I had to die. But this thing is so bad. So the question begs to be asked, if God knew all this, what's the one thing that Jesus never, ever knew? Last text. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Last text this morning. Listen to the Bible. What's that one thing that Jesus never, ever knew? 2 Corinthians 5, go to verse 20. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. Are you there, family? Now watch the Bible. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Verse 21. For he, that's God, hath made him, that's Christ, to be, what? Oh. To be sin for us who knew, no, what? Pause, right there. That's the answer right there. Though Jesus is omniscient, he knows everything. He knows what's going to happen five minutes from now, five hours from now, five days from now. He knows what's going to transpire. He knows everything except what sin is like. Oh. That's what the Bible just said. The Father made him to be sin. Many of us, we have this nonchalant, careless attitude about this thing that killed Jesus. Our sin is serious. But God is so good, Paul continues in the verse. Go back to verse 21. We'll read it from the beginning. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Now watch the transaction. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You all say amen at this church? You understand that verse I just read? Is he, he, the, oh, the Bible is telling us Jesus took our sins so that we can be made righteous in Christ. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, you give me your sin, I will give you my righteousness. Why, Jesus? Because I want you saved. What kind of exchange is that? Isn't that awesome? What kind of exchange? Jesus, hey, just give me that sin. Why? Because it killed me. We don't understand what happened. The rest will be on the screen. Only a few more quotes and we're done. We, we don't really understand how deep sin is. This is what Ellen White says. When Jesus was on that cross, Desire of Ages, page 693, she says, Could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic host as in silent grief they watched the Father? separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his beloved son, they, that's us, would better understand how offensive in his sight is what? Ooh. Come on, folks. See that quote on the screen? You know what she's saying in this quote? She is basically saying in a practical way, she starts off saying, could mortals, that's everybody here, because we're going to die. Okay? 
she's talking about mortals, and she says, the fa- if we could see this, if we, the thing is, we, didn't, we never saw the father separating his love from the son. We never saw how offensive sin is. And because of that, this is why we have such a careless, nonchalant attitude to this thing that killed Jesus. You understanding what's on the screen? Oh, uh, let me, oh, come on. Look, 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 look let me just fi- finish this. The father is separating his love from the son. You can't comprehend it. The, listen, the father and son, they have always been one. And we don't know how long. They have been one for billions and trillions, just timeless. You know when you get married, you're one with your spouse. Don't you love your spouse? You're all awake today? Man, I, I said, don't you love your spouse? Nothing. Amen. Man, I love my wife. I love my wife. Love her. She loves me too. Amen. We're one. When two get married, like Joel and Danielle, they're going to get married in a few months. They're going to be one. We've just been one for only seven years. Can you imagine being on the same page for billions and trillions of years? But on that cross, Jesus and the Father always being one, no arguments, always in agreement, God started to separate. See, this is one, together, one. But on the cross, Jesus, God the Father, started separating. Human mind can't comprehend that. Because we didn't see that, this is why we take sin. That's no big deal. I'll just sin, and I'll ask for forgiveness later. God is always there. That's presumption. God is always there. He's going to be there with me. What? In 1, Corinthians, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, the Holy Ghost was with King Saul. You get six chapters later in chapter 16, the Holy Ghost left them, And he was still king. You can have the Holy Ghost one day, Holy Ghost takes off the next day if you're presumptuous. This thing is serious. Because we didn't see this, Ellen White says. I'll close with this one quote. I want you to think. She says, God has exhausted whew, his benevolence or kindness in pouring out all heaven to man in one great gift. You ever been exhausted before? When you exhaust your funds, or another definition for it, to be exhausted, you know when you're running, I used to run track, I used to race a lot. You're running, you're running, you're running, you're running. You just stop. <laughs> Why? Because you're what? Exhausted. See, when you're exhausted, you have nothing left to give. God the Father, there was nothing else God could give to save humanity but his son. Exhausted all his benevolence. Exhausted himself. What kind of love is that? What kind of love is that? You can't comprehend that. And yet people will hear sermons preach, sermon preach, sermon, 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 and they will still harden their heart to the message of Jesus. Don't, I, don't, I don't get it. Mm. All right, Luella, that's where the rubber hits the road. This thing is about Jesus, folks. I want to leave that quote. You know what? I want to go back to that quote. You read that quote to yourself. But we need to get this thing. Jesus loves you so much, he wants you saved. He wants you saved, brothers and sisters. Why can't you be saved? You can be, you can be saved. You have to believe that. All heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm done. All heads bowed and eyes closed. You know, I'm making an appeal. My first appeal, you are here in the presence of the Holy Spirit because God, the Holy Ghost, is in this building. And you have a sin 
very specific direct appeal. You have a sin that you love. It's not a struggle. You love this one. And you're just saying to God this morning, God, I need help. Jesus, I saw what you did in Gethsemane. All that sin was dumped on you. I can't, I can't understand it. Lord, I accept your love and your forgiveness. I just need help. This sin in my life, I love it. I need help, Lord. I need help because the sin is separating me from you. If there is a sin or sins in your life right now that you love and you need help from Jesus, you raise your hand. You love it. This is not a struggle. You love it. Keep them up. I want to know who I'm praying for. Keep them up. Everybody praying. Because Jesus is chasing somebody this morning. Keep your hands up. Hands down. My second appeal, hands down. We're praying still. You are here this morning, and you have drifted far from God. You've drifted from God. There's no passion there. Morning devotion, what's that? But you're just saying this morning, God, I have drifted from you. I need help to come back. I desperately, desperately need to come back to Jesus. I have strayed. If that's you, raise your hand. Keep them up. I want to know exactly who I'm praying for. Keep them up. I've drifted from God. I just need help. Keep them up. Keep them up. Let us kneel together. Let us kneel together. I'm going to give you time to pray, talk to God about it. Those who raise your hands, you talk to God for a few uh, moments, and then I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, Lord, time is so short. Well, we see this morning, very, very simple Bible study. Jesus, you knew that you were going to die in heaven on earth as a preteen, on earth as a man, and yet you cried out for a plan B. Why? Because sin is so horrible. It's something you never knew. But Lord, you love humanity so much. Lord, the Bible says God made you to be sin. Lord, in exchange, you want to give us your righteousness. I can't explain that. Lord, we're all sinners saved by grace. No one here, eh, we need so much help. The pastor needs help. We all messed up without Jesus. I pray for those who raise their hands at the first appeal, saying, I have a sin in my life. I like it, but I need help because this thing is severing me from Christ. Oh, God, I pray that you'll help us all. You'll manifest your love and your power. Oh, we can do nothing without Jesus. But with Jesus, we can do all things because you will give us strength. I pray for those who raise their hands at a second appeal. Just being honest, we're just being honest. Lord, I have drifted from you. My devotional life is not good. I've drifted, and all I'm saying, Jesus, I'm not making any promises because I can't keep them anyway. I'm just, I just need help. That's it. Jesus, I need help. Oh, God, help your children. Oh, God, help your children. Help me. Oh, God, why? Because Satan is so angry, he knows his time is short. So, therefore, everybody in here, we need as much help as possible. Please, dear God, and I just want to thank you for not leaving me alone behind this pulpit. Preaching, that's, 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 a, that's serious. <laughs> it's not a game. Thank you, Lord, for being with me from the bottom of my heart. I thank you. Lord, bless your children here, a Fresno Asian that I love so dearly. God, please, Jesus, please, give us a love for righteousness and a hatred for sin. This thing killed Jesus. God, the reason why we take sin so lightly is because we never saw the separation of love. We, never, we didn't see it. And that's why we take it so, so lightly. Oh, God, we need help. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for dying. Thank you, God, for exhausting all your benevolence just to save us. We love you. Continue to be with us during this communion service. In Jesus' name I pray, let every child of the king say, Amen. God bless you all. I mean that.